Welcome to Grand Rounds, the first Grand Rounds of the year. Welcome to our distributed sites. Uh, today's uh, speaker is from the Division of Rheumatology and Dr. Kamsha Janya. The division head is going to introduce Dr. Marty. I think everybody here knows Dr. Bardi. He uh, um, was an astounding uh, uh, internal medicine resident and uh, rheumatology resident. He did additional training in uh, a number of things, including uh, point of care ultrasound and a lot of uh, many parts of the body, but also uh, with regards to uh, GCA. It was his idea to start a rapid access uh, GCA clinic. I initially thought, that's a dumb idea. <laughs> What's that going to do? And then I looked at the data and the studies that were done, and I realized that this was an outstanding idea, and uh, and he's run with it. And you're going to hear a little bit about yeah. that too. Anyway, it's a pleasure to have him with us, and he's on staff yeah. now, and uh, and he's doing on call, and he's uh, working downtown. Thank you, Colin. Hi, everyone. So um, we'll dive in. Uh, one, I just. Thank you for that introduction, Com. One uh, couple of special thanks I just want to also put out is to Daniel Ennis, um, Dr. Daniel Ennis and Dr. Natasha Degan, uh, who we worked together at the vasculitis clinic at Mary Pack, and um, we're, without their collaboration and support, I really wouldn't have the impetus to want to do a fast track clinic by myself. So, <laughs> so um, just to dive in, uh, I have no relevant disclosures. Um, Key objectives we're going to talk about today. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to review epidemiology of GCA, talk about pathogenesis, clinical manifestations in the spectrum of GCA, uh, and then ways that we diagnose GCA, because that's been rapidly expanding in the last 10 to 15 years, and then treatment pathways uh, that are emerging and what we're trying to set up with our fast track clinic. Really broad overview. When we think of vasculitis, we've, we categorize it into vessel size, small, medium, large. Um, Chapel Hill consensus criteria has been out to kind of give a framework to think about this. Um, you know, it's always struck me as how interesting it is, and we've talked about this amongst, amongst colleagues. When we think of giant cell arteritis, the fact that it's, you know, you get large vessel moment, but you get visual symptoms, and these are getting into small, like medium to small vessels has always struck us. So things don't fit into nice, clean boxes. Um, quick review in terms of the classification criteria. These have been around for quite a while, but patients with age over 50, new headaches, temporal artery abnormality, elevated inflammatory markers, and abnormal temporal artery biopsy. These are part of the classification criteria. Always emphasize that classification criteria are not the same as diagnostic criteria, so they use this as criteria for who to include into studies. And one thing that's changing, so there's nothing about imaging that's mentioned in these. And I'll just say this with a caveat. These are draft classification criteria, so these have not been finalized yet. Um, these were proposed at ACR, American College of Rheumatology, in 2018. And w what they propose is if you suspect GCA, there's a lot of contention around, whoop, there's a lot of, no, my pointer's not working. Uh, there's a lot of contention around um, who we, the age cutoff, they put 40. That's been very contentious. I would emphasize it's still people over 50, so please don't think GCA and people over 60. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and the reason they came up with this is uh, they looked at 2,000 cases around the world. There was a few cases that were in their 40s. That's controversial. But it's a point system in terms of the uh, classification criteria. So they have clinical features, which we're all aware of, in terms of morning stiffness, um, PMR-type symptoms, sudden visual loss jaw claudication, scalp tenderness. Um, if there's a temporal artery exam findings like cord-like or tender or uh, yeah. prominent temporal artery. Uh, laboratory findings, so ESR or CRP that's elevated. And then they have a temporal artery biopsy uh, value as well. And they define what definitive vasculitis versus probable is. So they've kind of flushed that out a bit more. But the part that's really new in this is the image findings. And that's been what's been added. And the point that I, the part I want to draw your attention to is where they talk about, does this, oh, it does work. Nope, that won't work. Okay, I'll, like, I'll stop trying to make that work. But basically ultrasound uh, has the same, ultrasound you'll see has the same weightage as a positive temporal artery biopsy. It gets five points. If you have auxiliary artery involvement, so that's large vessel involvement, 
on any form of imaging, that also gives points. Uh, or if there's uh, pet enhancement throughout the aorta. So that's the part that's been added, and we'll come back to this as well, okay? So when we think about the epidemiology, as Dr. Shajanya mentioned, so age over 50, um, mean age is 75. So really, in anyone under 50, if you're thinking GCA, you should really be thinking something outside of GCA. It's, it would be a really rare diagnosis of exclusion. Um, women are affected more commonly than men in most of our autoimmune diseases. PMR is more uh, prevalent, uh, has a higher incidence than GCA by about five times. Um, and as you see, we, when we look uh, across the world, there is a difference in incidence. We know that Northern Europeans are more affected by GCA and PMR. But we, and we're, what we're not quite sure yet is, is this a bias in the literature or is this actually true? And I think we're still looking at that. Um, uh, one thing I would say that is interesting that stands out wherever we look in the world is there is a seasonal and cyclic variation to, P to GCA more prevalent in spring and fall. Uh, and I think we see that when, even when we're on service um, in terms of the kind of referrals we get. Um, but what's interesting is because that's seen everywhere in the world in these patterns, it really makes people think, is there some sort of antigen process that triggers this? Um, and that's been a huge area where people are looking. One thing that, um, so if, is, with other data, and I don't have this up here, another way of reframing, so what does 80 per 100,000 mean? So some studies have looked at what is the lifetime risk of GCA? And when you think of it this way, they actually find it's about 0.5% in people over 50 is the lifetime risk. So one in 200 people over the age of 50 can get GCA, which is actually, that's common. So large about, so GCA is the most common form of vasculitis that we see. Um, PMR is about 2.5%. So, uh, you know, uh, one out of uh, you know, 30 to 40 people will get it. If you think of GVRD, I've crunched some numbers. There's some data out of uh, uh, Ontario looking at uh, incidents. It basically works out to about uh, 400 cases a year in the lower mainland is what we see. So almost a case a day throughout the lower mainland. And I think VGH gets about a case per week. Uh, St. Paul's, maybe not as much. but So it's, it comes up on a regular basis. Um, switching gears and talking a bit about pathogenesis. So I won't bore you with too much immunology here, but quick overview. Normal, healthy appearing vessel. We see adventitia media, intima. Um, what we know happens in GCA is essentially where GCA and polymyalgia rheumatic or PMR, what they share in common is this initial systemic inflammatory response where these cells move in from the outside of the cell to the inside. And there's this loss of immune privilege. Usually there isn't much immune activity in these large vessels. And for whatever reason that gets disrupted, cells begin to move in. It generates a strong IL-1, IL-6 response. And that creates a lot of the systemic inflammatory symptoms, constitutional symptoms, uh, PMR type symptoms of shoulder stiffness, hip girdle stiffness. And then when that starts, that process GCA and PMR share that in common, so that systemic inflammatory response. What changes over time is that in GCA, this propagates further and you get this interferon gamma response, and that's what leads to vascular remodeling and damage. And so what we see is as you go through these stages, you eventually get this disease vessel. So it becomes um, quite inflamed. A lot of the damage that we see is in the intima media complex, and we'll come back to why that's relevant. Um, and the other part about GCA is this doesn't happen throughout the entire vessel. This happens in skip lesions, right? So why that's important is when we talk about the role of biopsy later, okay? One question that I've always wondered about is what determines which vessels are affected, like why these temporal arteries, why the auxiliary or the aorta, and why not other arteries in the body? And people have tried to answer this question. Um, they've really looked at... Uh, these toll-like receptors, which are sen essentially sensors that pick up different antigens. And we find that they're actually not distributed evenly. So there's a study, they've looked at cadaveric studies. They take the different tissue samples, they look at them, and they find that when you look at different vessels, so temporal, subclave, and mesenteric, you see that toll-like receptors actually vary in terms of their uh, presence, and that toll-like receptor 2 and 4 may have an implication in, in giant cell. So it's just saying that different receptors throughout different parts of the body there's a commonality that's seen there. Maybe that has a part, and maybe that feeds back into, maybe there's an antigen that drives this disease because these receptors are picking up on it. So if there is an antigen, what's the trigger? And people, you know, different groups have been looking at this uh, closely. Uh, people have looked at different bacterial strains, um, like chlamydia, 
Uh, they've looked at different viral strains. You could spend a whole hour talking about different the, some of the literature that's come out in this area. One that's had a lot of attention uh, in the uh, recent years has been ZZV or varicella, because people have thought, you know, the risk of shingles goes up after the age of 50. Uh, it makes a really good argument that could shingles uh, be a trigger for GCA. On biopsy, they look very similar. Like when you get vasculopathy from shingles and your risk of stroke is uh, elevated for two years if you get shingles anywhere. But two groups have shown some association there, but other groups have not found that association. So despite, you know, it's been an area of controversy and uh, people looking. Um, maybe this is just an age-related phenomenon. So senescence as we age, they've done biopsies on, I don't know how they got ethics, but biopsies on people who don't have GCA <laughs> as you get older. And they just, they found that you get more lymphoid aggregates around the temporal arteries and that maybe there's some process as we age, we just lose this immunoprivilege and that triggers it. We don't quite know yet. So how does all this relate to what we see clinically and to the patient in front of us? So if we start thinking of PMR and GCA as a spectrum, um, it starts to give us a, a, a framework to think about this. So we all know that polymyalgia, common symptoms, stiffness in the proximal muscles, morning stiffness, and sometimes there can be peripheral arthritis, though that's less common. So they've done some really cool studies. If you take people who you only clinically suspect have polymyalgia and you do temporal artery biopsies on them, you find about 10% of them have positive temporal artery biopsies. So there's clearly some overlap there. What's more interesting is if you start to take people who you only think have polymyalgia and then you do uh, PET CTs, they'll find that approximately 30% of them actually get large vessel involvement. So there is some spectrum of uh, uh, interplay, and we know that 10 to 20% of people with polymyalgia can go on to get GCA. So whenever we see someone with polymyalgia, we're always asking about, you know, have you had headaches? You know, have you had any visual symptoms? And keeping that in mind, because if they they're at risk for developing GCA. But conversely, 50% of people with GCA have PMR um, as part of their symptom onset. So just a quick review on the musculoskeletal. We talked about so shoulder stiffness is to the most prominent. The people can get isolated neck stiffness as well, and hip, and gir hip girdle stiffness as well. Um, sometimes it can be tricky because they don't necessarily present with all of it at once. It could start unilateral and then become bilateral. So keep an index of suspicion in someone that uh, presents with symptoms. One caveat that I really want to emphasize here is in elderly patients, any form of systemic inflammation can present with proximal hip and shoulder girdle stiffness. So things to keep in mind, especially if patients don't respond to treatment, like you start them on 15 to 25 milligrams of pred, and 25 really being the upper limit, and they're not getting better dramatically, or their inflammatory markers don't come down the way you expect, or they still linger or they go up. I've seen cases of subacute bacterial endocarditis that presents with PMR. Uh, we think about malignancy. So there's a differential to keep in mind, um, and it's important to go through that. Um, elderly onset rheumatoid arthritis, about 40% of the time, involves large joints in the beginning. And the treatment pathway would really diverge, uh, so it's important to keep, a, keep in mind. And rarely, uh, 10 to 15% of the time, PMR and GCA can present with this. And this is, if any, some people are nodding their head, so this is uh, uh, remitting seronegative symmetrical synovitis with pitting edema, so RS3PE. When we see this, it can be a manifestation of PMR GCA, rheumatoid, and it has a per perineoplastic processes can present with this. So it has a workup on its own. But what I would say is keep this in mind in your elderly patient if they have other features of inflammation. Just keep in mind, could this be GCA or PMR as well? Um, we've talked about PMR. What I want to talk about next is cranial GCA. And when we think about cranial GCA, this is what we think of as classic GCA. It's one we're most familiar with. Patients who present with headache, temporal artery abnormalities, jaw claudication, uh, tongue claudication, visual symptoms. Um, and we've talked about some of the overlap, even with temporal artery biopsies and polymyalgia. Um, as we go through these symptoms, I'll just run through them quick. We think of headaches, right? So two thirds of patients can have headaches, but that means a third of patients don't have headaches. So absence of headaches doesn't rule out GCA. Um, and one note about the headaches, it could, you know, we, it, essentially anything from the neck up, you know, uh, 
I've seen patients who present with focal headache, diffuse headaches, temporal, occipital, it, it's just any new headache should be raised suspicion. And the other part is it tends to be non-responsive to analgesics, it's persistent. If people have a history of migraines, just it's really important to tease out how has their pet pattern of headache changed. But any sort of new headache in someone over the age of 50 would deserve a workup. Um, and this point, this picture here is just to emphasize scalp tenderness. Um, it does an ischemic complication, so it's actually tenderness on the scalp. If they're washing their hair, brushing their hair, and it's painful, or they put their head on their pillow and it's painful, that's a big clue. Much more specific for GCA. About 50% of patients can have scalp tenderness. Um, jaw claudication, again, it's an ischemic complication, much more specific for GCA. So people who get, it's not focal pain in the TMJ, it's really more of a diffuse ache in the masseter muscles. It could be in the tongue. So people who are chewing, talking, that this pain comes on and becomes progressively worse, present in about up to a third of patients. Um, these are complications, like with people can develop scalp necrosis. You can develop tongue necrosis. Um, I've seen two cases of tongue necrosis. It's not pretty. Um, patients will present with temporal artery abnormalities. And some patients really say, like, these arteries popped out of my head. Like, they show up and they tell you they're pointing to them. But about a quarter of cases, people can get uh, tenderness in the temporal arteries. They become prominent. Um, they can feel cord-like uh, or be pulseless. Those are some of the clues to them. And what we always fear when we think about GCA is the visual symptoms. Um, essentially, patients who have visual symptoms, they're suffering a stroke in the eye, right? And this is what, one of the reasons when we ever think about GCA, we start treatment up front and then we send them for workup because we're always concerned that could they lose their vision and that's a huge quality of life issue, uh, massive comorbidity to have. And approximately 15% of patients can present with visual symptoms. So double vision, blurry vision, transient loss of vision, so amaurosis, fugax, um, or if people complain that they have a curtain coming over their, their visual field, um, there's different ways it can present. Or some people just have sudden vision loss. If it's more of an occipital type headache, uh, stroke, they can just have sudden vision loss. So when we go back and think of the anatomy, from the internal carotid artery up to the ophthalmic artery going to the eye, so we're going from like, you know, medium to smaller, medium to into smaller, small vessels, if we zoom in on this area, what we're looking at, and the most common type of visual complication is people who, and so if we'll zoom in a bit further, people can get involvement of the posterior ciliary arteries, which are these ones. And in these cases, what happens is the optic disc can become pale and edematous. And this happens early on, and this is why whenever there's visual symptoms, we, like, we involve ophthalmology urgently up front. We want to see if we can help confirm the diagnosis of what they see on their assessment. Um, and this is what happens in about 90% of the time. This is an anterior ischemic optic neuropathy. Uh, so AION is what we commonly see. Uh, patients can have, if they end up having ciliary artery involvement, um, that looks different. That's about 10% of the time. And this, they call it a bright red cherry spot. This is involvement of the central retinal artery. If you take out this artery, this is the one that happens in about 10% of the time. And patients will tell you like there's a curtain coming over their vision. Um, and if they get involvement. So again, really important if when ophthalmology takes a look, people can have parts of their visual field loss, and if they get a branch retinal artery occlusion, they can lose part of their vision. Um, and more rare than that, if you get uh, like a posterior ischemic optic neuropathy, so that's retrobulbar, um, that's less than 5% of the time. Um, there's MRI studies that show they can get pure neural enhancement, but ophthalmologists, they won't really be able to see anything in the eye. And then even more rare, people can get occipital strokes and the eyes are totally fine, right? And that's just because they've lost their vision uh, from a cortical stroke. So lots of different ways. But the thing to emphasize is, and I don't think we see these cases as often, but there's a, what's referred to as ocular GCA or silent GCA. And ophthalmologists tend to see this, where about 3% of cases, they just have vision symptoms. That's it, they just present with blindness, with nothing else, which is terrifying. So, uh, we talked about polymyalgia, we talked about GCA from a cranial perspective, and what imaging has shown us in the last 10 to 20 years is that there's a form of GCA that's just isolated more large vessel involvement. And these patients are slightly different. Um, they present with more constitutional symptoms, weight loss, 
They can have PMR-type symptoms, claudication symptoms in the arms and the legs, um, and rainouts. That can be one of the presenting features. So we know that rainouts in your early life, in your teens, 20s, can be normal. It can be primary rainouts. But rainouts later in life, especially over the age of 50, new onset rainouts warrant to work up. It has a huge differential to think through. But uh, GCA is one of those ones to think about, especially large vessel involvement. These patients also tend to be a bit different. Uh, we said the mean age is about 75, but these patients tend to be a bit younger. They're usually in their 60s, and they're usually more refractory to conventional treatments. So just steroid treatment alone, they may have more of a relapsing refractory course, and those can be little clues that um, would warrant further workup. In terms of numbers, we think there's different ranges from different cohorts, but about 10 to 40% of cases could just be isolated large vessel involvement. So depending on which cohorts you've looked at. So one last point I just wanted to make on this slide. So the average time to diagnosis with GCA when you look at large cohorts is about seven months. Two thirds of cases can be very slow, gradual onset, but a third of cases can be really fast, sudden onset. So the timeline in terms of onset of symptoms doesn't help you rule in or rule out. And it's important to keep that in mind when patients present. So in terms of large vessel symptoms, think about claudication type symptoms, as we said, aneurysm formation. Sometimes I think cardiac surgery, they refer these cases as like, yeah, somebody had a dissection. We went in and it's just this really inflamed vessel. And then on path pathology, we find out afterwards that it was GCA. So they can present differently. So aneurysmal formation, it would be a big clue. Um, uh, claudication symptoms are the ones to think of. Raynaud's, as I'd mentioned. I think one of the things in managing these patients that's complex is in terms of their vascular health, their blood pressure can be a huge challenge. If they've taken out their axillary arteries and you're getting blood pressures that look normal, um, you know, I think having these patients seen at a hypertension clinic to have someone weigh in with, with more expertise in that is certainly warranted, as I think we struggle sometimes from a rheumatology perspective to know what is your true blood pressure and are we, if we don't treat it, we're actually going to propagate more vascular damage over time. A couple points on atypical manifestations, things that can be clues to think about. Um, pulmonary symptoms, so dry chronic cough. Um, PET studies have shown us that if you get pharyngeal artery involvement or bronchial tree uh, involvement, 10% uh, of patients can present with a dry chronic cough. And yeah, so it's atypical. Um, I wouldn't go chase every cough, but if, in somebody who has a dry cough, a high CRP, you know, uh, I'd maybe just think of the review of systems and to make sure that, you know, could there be something else going on? Uh, so that could be a, a little clue. Um, dental pain is also an atypical manifestation. Uh, I've seen two cases, I, I read it in the literature, but I, I, I didn't believe it until I saw it. patients who present with facial swelling. Uh, and there's some literature that shows that when you get involvement of these cranial arteries, uh, it reduces the drainage, the venous drainage out of the head. So I, I had one patient who said, my face is more swollen. I was like, oh, okay. But she got treated and it improved. So. And really rare, uh, and I didn't think, I didn't know about this before either, but um, uh, pericarditis is, can be extremely rare, less than 1%. And there's been some recent literature that's looked at this in terms of uh, uh, looking at large cohorts and trying to see does this actually occur. So, you know, we see pericarditis on CTU on medicine, and sometimes in the right clinical context, maybe worth at least considering on the differential. I think what shows up often uh, on medicine is patients who have FUO is fever of unknown origin, IUO is inflammation of unknown origin. And we see these cases often and people are like, what's going on? So this was a really nice study. They looked at about, um, they looked at about uh, 200, uh, almost 300 patients who all received a PET CT, which we don't have access to, but they had PET CT as part of their workup to look at what's the cause and in terms of fever of unknown origin and inflammation of unknown origin, I can tell you that GCA was actually, or large vessel vasculitis was at the top one, two, three. They had adult onset stills, and if you read this paper, there's a lot of contention around that, but the large vessel vasculitis is certainly there. So I think when these patients come on medicine or we're wondering, it's worth to at least think, could this be GCA? Do we need to consider that in the differential um, and to work through? I'm sorry, the caveat was all these patients in the study were over the age of 60 as well. So 
So we've talked about all these different manifestations of GCA. We've, thought, we've talked about how this kind of manifests in terms of symptomology that patients can have. I think what more recent literature is guiding us towards is to kind of rethink about now that we're imaging, we're imaging cranial vessels, we're imaging large vessels, and we're doing biopsies, people are now starting to think about is there clinical subsets in GCA? Um, and how do we, and how, do we start to stratify that and are they different? And I'll just quickly touch on this. This is a really nice study that was just published recently. Uh, it involved 26 countries, 940 GCA patients. Um, these patients had biopsy, they had imaging of their cranial vessels, large vessels, and it was, um, they basically tried to present little subsets of how patients presented differently by this uh, classification. So the classic GCA we think about with temporal artery that's positive, so this is, could have been positive either by biopsy or ultrasound, they don't have large vessel involvement. In this cohort of 940 patients, about 50% of the cases fell into this uh, uh, group. Patients with temporal artery involvement and large vessel was about 15%, and they found an interesting signal. These patients are more likely to have a, like a much higher CRP. Um, between these two groups, these are the patients who are typically older. Um, they found that fell into this, so over age 70. Then there's patients who have no, they couldn't find anything on temporal arteries, they couldn't find anything on large vessel, but they had a clinical picture that fit most consistently with GCA. And they found these patients had more morning stiffness, they had more leg claudication. I, to be honest, I, I, I struggled to wrap my head around that one a little bit, um, but then they, they, when they stratified across their different groups, like certain countries they found contributed to this pool much more than European and North American groups. So take that with a grain of salt. But the other group, and they have, this, these three groups as a whole, these are more people who have visual symptoms, they have temporal artery abnormality, they have ischemic symptoms. Then there's the group that's just more isolated large vessel involvement, about 10% in their cohorts. So that fits with other real world cohorts that I talked about. And again, more upper limb uh, uh, vascular abnormalities, more anemia, uh, to, so one of the things to look for. But as I alluded to before, more constitutional symptoms, more likely to have dry cough in a presentation and interestingly, more likely to have an elevated ESR compared to a CRP. So this is probably, the GC is the only disease that I'd advocate to be able to order both in ESR and CRP. But, so we've talked about different ways to, uh, that you know, this presents, different ways that there can be subsets based on imaging. But how do we actually confirm the diagnosis and how do we diagnose GCA? So I'll very quickly just touch on laboratory findings, um, look for inflammation. Uh, we generally use a CRP over an ESR. ESRs go up with age, so I never know in an 80-year-old what does an ESR of 40 mean, um, but a CRP that's elevated is clearly elevated. So more sensitive, be aware that 5% of the time the two can be discordant. So CRP can be totally normal, ESR can be really high, or vice versa. And that's the only time, like if, if you have a high suspicion and one comes back normal, order the other one, because that can help tip things for you. 5% of the time they're both negative. Um, and that's really tough. So I would just say if your clinical suspicion is high and the lab tests are both negative, um, keep pushing forward. There's data that tells us sensitivity of ESR and CRP around 80, 85%. So, you know, they're useful, but we can't totally rule out the disease if they're negative. Other elevated markers, I sometimes look at the SPEP if the others are abnormal, if there's an elevated alpha-2 globulin. Other markers we could look at if there's anemia or low albumin. These can be other little clues. In terms of ways that we confirm the diagnosis, I think you know the first temporal artery biopsy, so based on histology, was done in Mayo Clinic in the 1930s. So for about 70 years, that's what we've been using. And conventional angiogram, we don't really use anymore due to the risks associated with it. But CT, MR, uh, PET, and ultrasound is what we're going to talk about. So. One thing I would say, and this, is, this has become a, a discussion even in, in different health authorities, there's still a role for temporal artery biopsy. And, and when there's pushback about doing the temporal artery biopsy, I would say it has a very strong role yet. I don't think in North America or in Canada we're quite at a point where we can do away with biopsies. And even in Europe where they do a lot of ultrasound, they're still using biopsy. So I want to just emphasize that. So I'm not saying that it doesn't have a role. But we know that there's skip lesions in GCA. There's, parts of the artery that could be totally normal, and then other parts that are clearly uh, abnormal. Sensitivity of biopsy ranges from as low as 30% to as high as 70 to 80%. And there's things that can help us in terms of when we get a biopsy. So getting a long enough biopsy is important. 
requesting at least one and a half centimeters um, in terms of tissue is really valuable. Asking for, um, uh, there's some studies out of uh, Edmonton or Alberta, they've looked at if you go up to two centimeters, that can also increase the diagnostic yield. If you get bilateral biopsies, that can improve the yield by another 10%. So um, those are things that can be helpful. Um, but, and then the other part that this comes up a lot is sometimes people say, well, you know, you've been on treatment for a couple of weeks, let's ignore the biopsy, you don't even need it. You know, we know this is GCA. I would really caution against that. I think that, you know, the, the, and from a rheumatology perspective, when you're following patients and then they suffer an ADN from high dose steroids, they now have diabetes, they've gained weight, if you're not confident in the diagnosis and you can't hang your hat, to guide a patient through those complications um, is really challenging when you haven't confirmed the disease. But when you know with 100% certainty that this is the disease, you can help guide patients through those complications and be there and kind of support them through it. So, uh, you know, it's never really too late. Like even if it's six months out, I would still get a biopsy because if there's healed arteritis or if there's in damage to the internal elastic lamina, these can be other clues that can support the diagnosis. Um, ULAR uh, published a guideline in 2018 looking at imaging in large vessel vasculitis. Um, I had a chance to work with uh, Dr. Diamantopoulos, who's one of the world leaders in ultrasound, and we published a review paper looking at this. And we looked at it, this paper, uh, the, the ULAR guidelines goes through and looks at, okay, so what's the role for CT? CT is not able to help diagnose for cranial symptoms yet. It just doesn't have the resolution. For large vessel involvement, for aneurysm, stenosis, vessel wall enhancement, sensitivity is about 60 to 70%. So it's not great, but it's probably one of the easiest ones we go to because we can get it quickly. Um, and there's probably a role in re-imaging over time. I don't, I don't have the slides to present it here, but some of the vascular changes take six months to a year to develop. So if you have a suspicion, it is worthwhile to re-image. If you think somebody has more large vessel involvement, you need to get imaging of the large vessels, so CT or MR would be your go-to. When we think about MRI, this is an image from a three Tesla MRI, which we don't have access to here, um, but you can actually see really nicely the cranial arteries that are um, enlarged there. They can look for enhancement, thickening there. MR is really great in the sense that it's um, highly sensitive, 80 to 90% in terms of sensitivity. Um, the downside's price, so about $2,500 per MR, is not cheap. Uh, time in the machine, uh, it's, it's a longer acquisition scan. Availability of three Tesla MRI, which most centers don't have. And then if four days of high dose PRED, the, the sensitivity drops to less than 50%. So you lose a lot of sensitivity very quickly. Um, if you look at PET, again, it's great in the sense that it's highly sensitive, so 80 to 90% in terms of sensitivity. New PET technology in terms of how they do the scans, they can actually look at the cranial vessels now. That's more recent in the last couple of years. You can look for other things like infection, cancer, uh, so it helps in the differential diagnosis. Downside, price, so about $3,500 per PET scan. Availability, outside of cancer in BC, it's really hard to get a PET scan. Um, radiation, so much more radiation than conventional CT because now you're adding the, uh, the, the positron emission. And interpretation, unless you're in a center that actually does a lot of this, atherosclerosis can look like large vessel vasculitis. And I've gone to conferences where they do little quizzes, and the radiologist is like a 50-50 split sometimes. And it's very insightful because you said they're like, you're a radiologist who look at PET scans, and you guys struggle with this. Oh, so what's, you know, so I would say PET, unless it's being done in a center with high volume, I would be cautious about interpretation. Same issue as MRI, four days of high dose PRED, your sensitivity is less than 50%. So you lose sensitivity very quickly, and um, there's no way we're gonna get PETs in the foreseeable future in like a short, you know, three days. So if we go back to these guidelines, one of the things they actually recommended up front is if you see a patient with suspected with GCA, ultrasound of the cranial vessels and the auxiliary arteries would be the first line test they recommend. Because of, there's cost, ultrasound costs about three, three to $400 per scan, there's no radiation, there's no contrast medium given. The evidence, sensitivity is about 70, uh, so 77%, specificity 96%, positive likelihood ratio of 19. So if you have somebody that you're like, ah, oh, maybe 50% pretest probability, that can certainly push you to a positive test, negative likelihood ratio of 0.2. There's a few caveats to this. You need proper equipment, you need proper training. This isn't just something to go pick up and do. Uh, so I spent time in Norway and the UK learning how to do this. Um, and 
if you actually stratify, th this includes inf uh, data from the early 2000s, if you actually remove the early 2000 information where they had lower quality equipment, and you look at more modern equipment, the sensitivity is in the 80 to 90 percent range as well. So it's very sensitive. Um, one really quick point I'll make here, and this is, I think this is just really insightful. We do pathology rounds in rheumatology, and whenever we get the pathologist to come talk to us, it's, we learn a lot doing that. So this was a study called Tabool. They looked at 350 cases of people with suspected GCA. They all went for biopsy. They all went for ultrasound. So they took 30 of their cases and they asked their pathologist, their 14 pathologists, to look at the cases. They wanted to see how well did the pathologists agree with each other. What was their intra-observer agreement? And it was about 0.7. It's about 30% of the time they actually don't agree with each other, which is insightful because we see that when we do our uh, pathology rounds. The patholo they don't always agree. But then I thought, okay, how about the sonographers? And look at the data from the sonographers. It's almost the same. So the intra-observer agreement for sonographers was about uh, 0.7 as well. So they actually didn't differ that much. And this actually shouldn't be a surprise, okay? And the reason I say that is, what is a biopsy? It's, it's an image. A biopsy is an image. It's tissue we take, we turn it into an image, and we look at it. And when we take an ultrasound probe, and the frequency, the high frequency probes we have now, their resolution is now in the 0.1 millimeter range. So we're seeing really fine detail. And when we actually look at ultrasound and we generate an image, we can see the intima media complex. And when we look at a vessel in longitudinal, we can see that intima media complex very clearly. When we uh, put on Doppler, we can see blood flow. This is a normal appearing vessel. In abnormal vessels, we can see that thickening, that uh, uh, hypoechoic or darker bands. That's swelling that we see in the vessel. And the, um, uh, to, the, to the far, uh, your right, <laughs> uh, you can see a, that's what's called a halo sign. And we've, there's agreed upon criteria now, what we call a halo sign. Um, you know, this is a homogenous hypoechoic swelling. Um, and the other thing that's more recent is this thing of, called a compression sign. So normal healthy vessels, when we squeeze them, they actually compress fully. Edematous inflamed vessels don't squeeze. So I'll show you a video here. This is a scan I did. And that you can see with this patient, as we go through, this is a positive compression sign. As you go through, this is an inflamed, thickened artery. Uh, when you compress it, uh, it doesn't compress. The ultrasound assessments they do here at St. Paul's, I've talked to the radiology group. They're going to start changing their assessments. They don't do compression testing. It's very valuable uh, to do as part of the assessment. So they're going to start doing that. And so currently at St. Paul's, they look at the temporal artery, the common temporal, and they look at the auxiliary. Um, we're talking, so when in, in Europe and the way uh, we currently, that I scan, we look at frontal, parietal, temporal, uh, carotid, vertebral, subclavian, auxiliary. So there's a lot more territory to cover, and they're going to look at expanding the protocol here too. But at, uh, at, for our fast track clinic, that's going to be our protocol, is to do all of them. Really interesting uh, study. So ultrasound is helpful for diagnosis, but this is the first study that's actually come out looking at this, is can ultrasound be prognostic? And so we're doing a study here in Vancouver. We're comparing our ultrasound to our biopsy rate, but one of the things we're also looking at is can ultrasound be prognostic? And this, um, Dr. Dasgupta in the UK is who I worked with, and they were talking about this. So it's nice to see their paper published. What they showed here is, and people have wondered this, if you scan somebody and all their cranial vessels light up, versus you scan somebody in just the frontal artery, is that different? Like, is that more predictive or not? And we've been wondering, and this is the first thing to say, yeah, in fact, it is. So if you find two or more vessels compared to just one, these patients are at higher risk to actually have uh, ocular ischemia. So 30% versus less than 5% in patients who just have one vessel involved. So there's some role there. The thing to stay tuned for is, can ultrasound and vessel involvement be predictive of who's remitting, refractory, relapsing, but we still need more time. And our study is going to look at that, but it has a two-year follow-up, so it's going to take time to get that data. Um, last point that we'll get into is treatment pathways. And when we think of GCA, you know, in terms of the initial treatment, um, initial treatment in terms of prednisone can be 40 to 60 milligrams. I would say you know, going beyond 60 milligrams, you're just inviting more complications from high-dose PRED. There's really, uh, there's some early data that's shown us that you don't really need to go beyond 60. You could consider in patients who don't have any ischemic complications, so jaw claudication, scalp tenderness, or visual symptoms to start even 40 milligrams. 
uh, and see how they respond. Certainly anyone with visual symptoms, you send them to eMERGE, they get pulsed steroids. The role of aspirin is becoming more controversial, but generally we counsel patients they are going to be on treatment for one to two years to help set expectations. There's a lot of other comorbidities that we have to think of managing when we see these patients in terms of diabetes, hypertension, cataracts, osteoporosis, vaccinations. We monitor uh, basic labs, but patients who are refractory, and there's a difference in pattern of practice. Like some people will consider starting methotrexate up front. Yep, and I, that's my pattern of practice too. I think that it, there is, there's, you know, the quality of evidence isn't amazing, but there is some evidence that tells us it has a steroid sparing effect. It takes time to recognize that effect, and there's this new study that's going to come out comparing tocilizumab, which is a biologic, to methotrexate um, that's we're all eagerly awaiting. Um, other biologics we use, tocilizumab, in the draft guidelines for GCA at the ACR, they're saying to use tocilizumab up front. Very controversial, very expensive, but um, there's other biologics to be considered. But the point I just want to emphasize with the slide is there are biologics we're starting to use. Over the last 20 years, we saw how, rheum how rheumatoid arthritis has changed. Uh, there's like five active trials in GCA right now with other biologics. It's a very evolving field, and I think in the next five to 10 years to come, we're going to see other agents that we're going to use more frequently. So how does this all tie together? We've talked about diagnostics. We've talked about uh, imaging, treatment. I want to introduce the idea of a fast-track clinic. These are clinics that were started in Europe initially, in the UK and Norway, that when they saw cases of suspected GCA, they would see these patients within 48 to 72 hours. So rapid assessment, it included an ultrasound assessment as part of that initial evaluation to help confirm or uh, the diagnosis or dispute it. And what the, what the data, I don't have, I'm not presenting the data on these fast track claims, but what they were able to show is that there was reduced risk of stroke and vision loss. Um, and they really reduced those numbers from about 15% down to 5%. So huge improvements there. And there's data that tells us that there's a cost savings in terms of complications from high-dose steroids hip fractures, osteoporosis complications. So the way these clinics work, if you have a case that you suspect, so somebody who's over 50, somebody who's got symptoms that you think could be compatible with GCA, and they have a, an acute to subacute onset of symptoms, so not somebody who's been having symptoms for years. Um, and the elevated inflammatory markers, that doesn't, if they, if they don't have that, that doesn't preclude them from being evaluated. But if they have those first three, then you could certainly refer them the one caveat is if they have visual symptoms with double vision, partial loss of vision, please send them to their eMERGE. Uh, they need to be seen. They need to get IV steroids. Uh, they need uh, ophthalmology to see them urgently, okay? If there's delays in getting them to the eMERGE, if you're somewhere remote or rural, yes, yeah, start them on high-dose PRED, but get them uh, there quickly. Essentially, everybody else, um, what we can do is we're happy to see them. Uh, if they don't have any uh, ischemic complications, jaw claudication, scalp tenderness, uh, any visual symptoms, 40 milligrams of prednisone is fine to start them. If you're not comfortable with that, put them on 60. That's okay. We can look after the rest. What we like to do is essentially the way the fast track service works is these patients come in. This is a very busy slide, but I'll direct your attention a little bit. So if the pretest probability is low, and there is, uh, our study is looking at validating a, a pretest probability score. So people are trying to find a way to formalize who is low pretest probability. So it's being looked into. But if they're low pretest probability and their ultrasound scan is negative, we say this is very unlikely to be GCA. Uh, we should go look for other causes. Um, in our study right now, when we see these patients, we're still sending them for temporal artery biopsy. In Europe, when they see patients like this, they're like, no biopsy for you. Uh, you know, so that's really cut down on their biopsy rates. Conversely, if you have a high pretest probability that this is GCA and their ultrasound scan is positive, Great, you've made a diagnosis. Um, again, in these centers, in European centers, they're not doing biopsies in these patients. They've confirmed the diagnosis. They know what's going on. For us, for our study, we're still doing biopsies to compare how we're performing uh, as part of our validation, but that's how that would go. And then that leaves everybody in the middle. So if they have an intermediate pretest probability or a high pretest probability and the ultrasound is negative, what do we do? And this comes back, we still want to try to confirm the diagnosis. So in, in European centers, these are patients they are still sending for biopsy. Um, their biopsy rates have come down from down to 5 to 10% of what they used to be because the sensitivity is so high with the imaging modalities that much fewer people need further diagnostic testing. In centers that have it, like in the UK, they'll send these patients for PET-CT. We don't have access to that, but we'll pursue more imaging. 
so MRI-ACTA, to look for large vessel involvement. And the whole point is all these, uh, what these fast track services aim to do is to really do a few things. One, we want to provide rapid assessment, so we'll see them within 72 hours. We want to prevent sight loss and stroke. We want to get a timely diagnosis. And the last point is to minimize the impact of prednisone. Since, Jan since June to now, uh, when I've done an audit of our data, I've seen about 35 patients, that, I've seen about over 90 cases of suspected GCA. Well, 30 patients that so far we've said, this isn't GCA, we've stopped the prednisone within a week of it being started. And so far, uh, mm -hmm. no one's had any complications from that. So nobody then, so I've, I've yet to see a case in our kind of like interim analysis that anyone who we said is negative, but then actually went on to either have a positive biopsy or uh, complications after starting the prednisone. So with that, I'll end my presentation and, Can you just comment on the yeah. thing that money saving was with the hospital stay and one of the Oh, yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, one thing I'll say, the, re, the po point to emphasize is they actually showed that the number of inpatient admission for GCA came down. So the average patient with visual symptoms, the average date length of admission was 3.6 days. After initiation of fast track clinics, it came down to 0.6. So sometimes they just need to come in, and if they have visual symptoms, they get their IV steroids, then they're treat managed as an outpatient, or they come back for outpatient steroids, uh, for IV steroids, but they don't actually have to be admitted, which is a huge part on part of healthcare savings. They even showed that the complications from hip fractures, osteoporosis, uh, hypertensive urgencies, diabetic emergencies, all of these complications also came down in centers that implemented it. Okay, uh, uh, we have time for questions. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. So questions? Yes. Uh, what do you use to follow your patients over time as a parameter readout to say, all right, this patient is doing okay, I can taper the prednisone faster or whatever. What do you use for that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of what we use to taper, uh, to, to follow disease, so we actually use ultrasound. So there, the studies, People have the data, it's just not out yet because people are following patients for five years now and they're starting to put the data together. But you can, so what, what I didn't comment on was the cranial vessel enlargement, that edema that we see, that swelling, within two weeks of starting high dose prednisone, that starts to normalize. So they've done studies where you, if you scan someone every three days, by about two weeks, the, the cranial vessels should normalize. And so as you follow someone, if they begin to, if they have a flare or they relapse, if you've been, if you follow them every six months or so, you can see that if they start to flare, those vessels become thickened again. So that's another parameter uh, that you can follow. In the large vessel, it's much more challenging because whether you use MRA, CTA, PET, ultrasound, you can see thickening in the large vessels. But over time, we expect it to come down. That was what we would expect. But it may not ever normalize because the remodeling that takes place in the vessels can leave uh, persistent thickening or signal even on in other imaging like MRA and PET. But it, what I've seen in the UK and in Norway is as they follow these patients when they flare, they go back and they just do serial measurements. They monitor those. And uh, you'd expect that it, shouldn't, it should never get bigger. So if you're tapering someone off treatment and their CRP grumbles a bit or they start having some fever or some constitutional symptoms, if, if there's intimal medial thickening again, then you know they're flaring. Uh, you can, yeah, we follow CRPs, yeah, definitely. If someone had a discordant CRP, like if we knew their CRP is not useful, we'll follow their ESR. We'll follow basic labs, like a CBC uh, and CRP. There isn't really much more to follow, unless they're on other medications like methotrexate or biologics. We'll follow other lab markers, but not for the disease activity. Yeah. Any other <coughs> comments or questions? I have a uh, question. So mm -hmm. the population that you alluded to, I would have said previously that people from the so Chinese, Japanese, rarely have temporal arteritis. Yeah. Giant cell arteritis. Yeah. And you, you alluded to the fact that that's, that may be in question now. Is that correct? Well, they're wondering whether it's a... a yeah, sir, I'll, I'll repeat that question. Um, uh, Dr. Kass was saying that, uh, you know, the prevalence or the incidence of giant cell arteritis in Asian populations appears to be lower, and we're wondering whether that's raised in question. The point I would say is there, there's some bias in the literature. So we don't know if it's just not reported as often versus if it just doesn't come up as frequently. So I think that's we're, we're staying tuned. As more literature is coming out of China, people are looking at that too to see.
sorry, but the, but our experience here yes. is do you think do you think we're just not biopsying people of Asian origin? Oh no, I, I do think that like we like even when we look at our cases here, like there's certainly more Northern Europeans, and I think that still holds. But I have seen patients who are uh, East Indian who are like uh, of Asian descent as well. I just don't think that we know what their true incidence is. Yeah. yeah. Any other comments or questions? Where's your clinic? Yeah. So um, so part of the fast track clinic that we're setting up is through Mary Pack. We're I'm anticipating that hopefully by June the fast track service will be up and running as Dr. Ennis and Dr. Dagon are going through their training to learn to do ultrasound as well. So as they gain more experience, I think we'll be ready to launch. Uh, personally, I set up my clinic downtown, so I do see these patients in my own private practice. Sometimes I see them at Mary Pack. We have equipment there to also scan them. Um, but my, I'm set at uh, Seymour Clinic just on Hornby and Drake. So I'll, and here, one thing I'll just say, just really quickly, um, so my email address is there. I've included Dr. Ennis and Dr. Natasha Degan's email as well. I really want Dan, Dan, I gave you a thank you in the beginning. I did not update the slide, <laughs> sorry. But I just wanted to take a moment. Thank you, Dr. Shajanya, for uh, it being supportive and helping me kind of build this uh, idea out. It wouldn't have been possible without you. Um, to Dr. Degan, because she's the lead for the Vascularized Clinic, and without her uh, support and endorsement, there's no way this would have taken off. And Dr. Diamantopoulos, because he's been a fantastic mentor. So. Thank you for uh, allowing me to come present. Just before we yeah. conclude, I wanted to mention that next week's Grand Round, sorry, next week's Grand Round um, is a special guest. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to put my glasses on. Uh, <clears throat> so it's, it's actually um, sponsored by uh, uh, Anesthesia and Pharmacology. And the guest is Dr. David Jurlake, who's a uh, clinical pharmacologist from Toronto. So he'll be speaking next week. Um, Thanks, Mr. Buddy. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's what I, I so probably in the last six months, specifically I probably think three five people. Um I have one very nice yeah, yeah. 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 I have a very I I'm not I, I, I agree with you. It's rare, but I have had a lot of I have, I've had, I know there's two specific that I've done on both of them. That's great. I mean, but relevant to the number of people here, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, it's, I've seen more problems with people making it out of my community. When I look at the subset of those patients, like I said, I don't think you have GCA. Yeah. They're more Asian. Yeah. 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 They, they are. Uh, they are. And, but yeah. And some of them were eating the whole diet. I just want to say hi. Nice yeah. to see you. Really when did you grow up so quickly? <laughs> Six years ago. Oh, so big. Yeah. Thank you. We go back on. Yeah. I can see that. I, I don't want to know Medical where you go back. Yeah. Medical yeah. Days. You, you wrote my letter when I talked to him. So thank you. Yeah. 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 Back around in yeah. town. Yeah. Why? Why? Oh. Thank you. 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 Thank you.